I work, as Chris said, at the USGS. Uh, I'm a solid Earth geophysicist, which means I use remote means to look inside the Earth. Geophysicists have lots of tools to look inside the Earth. Um, just like doctors have x-rays or MRIs or CAT scans, for example, to, to use physics to look at your body, we have different ways to, to look at the Earth. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, so the work that I do um, that I'm going to talk about here relates to volcano hazards. But geophysics is of the kind that we all do apply to a lot of different problems. I also work on looking at ice sheet uh, dynamics problems in Antarctica with Sam Mukasa's over here, uh, some of my Antarctic buddies. Uh, I've worked in Afghanistan and Mauritania, which is in the Sahara Desert, uh, related to mineral resource supplies. Um, and so like all geophysicists, our science is global. We work globally and we work with global partners. Uh, because of the work I do, I'm associated with the Near Surface Geophysics Focus Group. The other, um, I, I'm also affiliated with VGP, Volcanoes, Geochemistry, and Petrology, Cryosphere, Tectonophysics, and Geomagnetism and Paleomagnetism, and who knows others. But it's just to show you that the application is quite wide. Um, so this is how uh, you have seen me. No one at the USGS had ever seen me looking like this. <laughs> And uh, in fact, they all required uh, the first year that I wore my Jimmy Choo shoes, the long Jimmy Choo shoe story, uh, a whole bunch of them were against the wall and made me demonstrate that I could walk in those shoes. <laughs> um, this is how I look at other times, though, not all the time. This is uh, next to a helicopter in, at Mount Baker, Washington, of a couple years ago, uh, slinging several thousands of pounds of, of gear up to the top of the volcano. And this is me right here in Hawaii. Um, so we get to go places and, and do fun things in the field. So I'm going to talk about uh, the geophysics of volcanic landslides. Now, when most people think of hazards from volcanoes, you automatically think of big eruptions, you know, Krakatoa, Mount St. Helens. But some volcanoes, there ha or you know, lots of lava coming out of volcanoes like in Hawaii. But some volcanoes have a different kind of hazard, which relate to uh, big landslides that convert into mud flows or rivers of mud. And that's the kind I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> and a lot of them originate in what's called hydrothermally altered rock. I'll talk about that in a minute, but just think of rotten rocks. And a prominent example is uh, from a volcano in Colombia, 1985, Nevada del Ruiz. Had a small eruption, not too big, it's a cloudy day, created a mud flow. These mud flows are a mixture of rock and ice and water. On the tops of the volcanoes, they can go 100 miles per hour. Uh, this one, the lower slope, reached about 30 miles per hour, 125 feet thick. Imagine a river of concrete coming at you at those kinds of speeds. That's what these mud flows do. Two and a half hours after this relatively small eruption, Mud flow came to this town of Armero and killed 23,000 people. So what we want to know, of course, is how do we prevent this from happening again? Can, and of course, most people say, can this happen here? Well, it can happen uh, and has happened in the United States. Um, and I'm going to talk a little about the places where we've had those kind of mud flows in the past. Uh, Mount Rainier towers over, this is Tacoma, um, Mount Adams, Mount Baker, and we talk a little about Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens is a little different. It doesn't have this rotten rock, which you can see up on this, on Mount Adams, it's very yellow. This hole here is caused by this landslide here. Um, Mount Rainier, you can see sort of rotten rocks on the west side. Um, so these three volcanoes, Mount Baker, which is on the Canadian border, Mount Rainier, which is 60 miles southeast of Seattle, um, and Mount Adams in Washington, as I mentioned, their primary hazard, like Nevada del Ruiz, are not big eruptions. They're these, these landslides that originate in these rotten rocks, these clay-type rocks. So to, I'll show you a picture of them. I was going to bring some rocks with me, but I left early because we got 14 inches of snow in Denver, and I thought I might miss, miss this talk if I left today. Um, but the hydrothermal alteration, when a volcano erupts, it has, anyone's, if anyone's been to Hawaii, you can smell sulfur, right? So that gas, when it mixes with ice, converts to sulfuric acid and can rot the rocks like that. So you take a hard rock and you can convert it to something that looks like a soil. So you can imagine that that's sitting up high, imagine an ice cream cone, not very stable. 
So the clays that form as a result of this process can weaken a volcanic edifice, making it a lot less stable than if the clays weren't there. But they also retain water. So once you get a slide going, it's triggered for some reason, um, an eruption, for example. Uh, it mixes with the other more competent rocks, the groundwater, and the clays retain water and lubricate this slide so it goes 20 times further than those without clays. So it's a double whammy. Um, the other thing our, our research has found, most people have thought that volcanoes, uh, that water just goes through volcanoes and out the bottom, but we found that actually water stays up on the top, and that, that's a hazard itself. So in order to understand how hazardous are the volcanoes, we need to know the three-dimensional distribution of these clays, these rotten rocks, and water. Uh, Mount Rainier, um, I'll show you this. This is a map showing the mud flows in the last 5,600 years. There was a giant one, uh, bigger than the one in Colombia, that came off the east side of the volcano uh, 5,600 years ago. It went 60 miles all the way down to, to Tacoma. Mike, if you're driving from Seattle off to Mount Rainier, you get it all of a sudden from hills into this very nice smooth topography. That's because all the old topography got filled by these mud flows. And this is Mount St. Helens, but same for Mount Rainier. When this, mud, when this landslide went, it created a gigantic crater, ripping out most of the volcano. It has subsequently rebuilt. So yes, we've had these kinds of mud flows in the United States. I'm going to show you a picture from Orting, which is about 25 miles from Mount Rainier. This guy had a bad day. He's digging to, for a foundation, and this is a stump of a tree. Uh, he's scratching his head. So this is, you know, 15, 20 feet, 25 miles away, a mud flow from 500 years ago, and there's no evidence that for any obvious, mag, you know, uh, eruption trigger. So we don't. So some of these mud flows can get triggered by something very small, maybe a small earthquake, or maybe a small eruption to get it recorded, or maybe rain flow. So it's not like Mount St. Helens, where there was a big, big eruption and a landslide together. So how do we look inside these volcanoes to try to figure out how much rotten rock and water are there? Well, there's some, the two methods I'm going to talk about are uh, electromagnetism and magnetism. Some rocks can conduct electricity, uh, clays and water, for example. Some rocks are magnetic. Uh, volcanic rocks are quite magnetic, unless they're altered. And we can um, fly uh, instruments that measure these rock properties from a helicopter. This is one kind of system. It's, this bird is 18 feet long, and um, it's flying off to Mount Adams. So we can tell the difference from this kind of data between a hard rock and this rotten rock by their rock properties. So volcanic rocks are very, if they're dry, are very electrically resistive. Current doesn't like to go through them. Um, and they're very magnetic. Once they, they become rotten like this, they become very electrically conductive, especially if they're wet, and they're very weakly magnetic. And the ice is very resistive and non-magnetic, so we can see right through it with this system. Here's another system. This is flying at Mount, um, Mount St. Helens. This is a different kind of system. And the way it works is that um, a generator powers current through this loop. It's called the magnetic induction. It's really basic physics. I have a stove that operates like this, an induction stove. Judy might, too. In Europe, they like them. But anyway, the current goes around the loop, creates a magnetic field, goes in the ground, Changing magnetic field induces electric currents in the ground that make a secondary magnetic field. All this is, gets returned back to the helicopter, and it can tell you something about the electrical resistivity in the ground. So for example, uh, you'll get weak signals from dry volcanic rocks and ice and strong signals from groundwater and clay. So we can use these to map these kinds of um, rocks in the subsurface. Here's an example. So we have taken the data we collected from the helicopter and made a, a resistivity model. And this is a picture of the model at 100 meters depth beneath Mount Rainier, Mount Baker, and Mount Adams. So the red colors indicate areas where you've got most likely ice and dry volcanic rocks. And the blue and light blue areas are the areas that have the potential to be this rotten rock and water or maybe just water. Um, so we, have these, we make these resistivity models. Similarly, we, we, this is magnetic anomaly data, not models. Um, this is over Rainier, Adams, and Baker. The red colors are showing places that are more magnetic than the surrounding rocks, and the blue places are showing uh, areas that are less magnetic than the surrounding rocks. 
this map's a little hard to tell. The blue areas are not necessarily where the rotten rocks are. They can be valleys. Um, but we use this kind of data to make another model. So the magnetic data can see to thousands of meters. You can actually see 20 kilometers down, where the electrical data can see about 100 or 200 meters down. So by combining analysis of the magnetic data which, and um, the uh, resistivity data, we can come up with a, a picture of the inside of the volcano. We combine that with rock property measurements. We have all of these different kinds of rocks. This is unaltered, and these are of various kinds of rotten rocks, if you will. And we can, we've collected them from the volcano or from some of the landslides from the volcano. We can measure them in the lab. This is a resistivity, 10, 100, 1,000 ohmmeters with water. The different colors indicate whether it's got alteration. If it's blue, it has it. If it's red, it doesn't. But the point of this is to show that we use rock properties in the lab to then compare to the models that we make from our, our um, airborne data. And so we can come up with a picture of the inside of a volcano. This is a pretty classic geophysics sort of picture with these blocks. Geologists always laugh. Um, we, what we see is that, for example, at Mount, Mount Adams is very much like an ice cream cone. This blue area here are the, the places where you've got thick, this is probably 500 to 1,000 meters thicknesses at least, of this rotten rock. And there's water all over the volcano. That's the green. Um, at Mount Rainier, we have a thick section on the west side of the volcano, very thin on the, on the, on the top. A lot of people thought that it was going to be uh, hydrothermally altered all through the volcano. Mount Baker has just a little bit of alteration in a couple places um, on the volcano. We know what this looks like. They're not blue blobs in the field because we can see, and this is at Mount Baker, this is probably what the, this is what the blue blobs look like. Um, this is another place where this would be the hydrothermally altered rocks and very fresh rocks. So you have an alternating pattern. This is my husband, so six foot two for scale. Um, and so this is, this is what we can see from the geophysical modeling. We have the blue blobs. We know where they are. Uh, we know that they're altered, most likely altered rocks with water in them. So what? What difference does that make? Well, you can take um, the rocks that you collect in the field and put them in the lab and squeeze them and find out how strong they are. So from our geophysical models, one of my colleagues uh, measured the rock strength properties in the lab and came up with this map. This is from a paper by Mark Reed showing the relative stability of the volcano. So this is Mount Rainier. And what it shows, this red bullseye, is a danger area. So this is the area that is most likely to slide on the volcano. We haven't done this analysis for Mount Adams or Mount Baker, but I did a simple thing, but I took, made a slope map. So the red areas are very steep slopes and superimposed the outline of our geophysical models of where the rotten rocks are and where the red steep slopes intersect with the model are probably the likely places to, to have a landslide. So you see it's the west side of, of Mount Adams and maybe a little bit here on Mount Baker. This area is pretty low on the slopes. It's not as serious. But even a little bit on Mount Baker can be serious because right here is a big damned lake. So even a little bit of a mudslide can fill that lake up and increase the um, flooding hazards for Bellingham. Uh, similarly, even though Mount Adams is pretty far away from population, there's a river here uh, that goes right into the Columbia River, and it's not very far. You had a big mudslide that helped block the Columbia River, and there's evidence for these mud, mud flows on the other side of the Columbia River <clears throat> be pretty uh, hazardous in a variety of ways. Okay, so we know that these areas are dangerous. How do we prevent all the deaths that we had in Columbia from happening in Washington? Well, it turns out you can monitor for this particular kind of, they're called you know, landslides, debris flows. And they have different, it's, it's acoustic, so they make sounds. If you, you know, if you heard one of these things rumbling down the mountain, you probably would know what it is. It sounds different than an earthquake. So the USGS has developed a sensor for sensing these debris avalanches. And this is just some of the characteristics of the difference between a mud flow and an eruption. So you can warn people about an impending landslide. Our um, maps also show you where you should put this acoustic flow monitor. So in the case of Mount Rainier, for example, 
you'd put one on the west side of the volcano all the time, and there is one. Uh, if the volcano started to become active, then you might monitor the whole volcano. So it's, a, it's also a cost-effective strategy for, for deploying your instruments. Okay, so now you know there's one coming. <clears throat> You've got the, the, the warning. You have to train the people in the, in the communities to be able to, res to know what to do when they hear, uh, get a warning of one of these debris avalanches coming. So <clears throat> USGS, my colleagues in the Cascade Volcano Observatory have gotten together with county officials to talk about the dangers, and they have done lots of drills, putting kids in school buses to, to leave town. And um, from those exercises, they realize they only have two bridges out of town. It's basically the bottom of a river valley. You can just climb up and get out of the way. If the people in Armero had had two and a half hours of warning to, uh, of this mud flow, they could have just gone up to the adjacent hills and saved at least some of the people. So this is how you can translate <clears throat> data that we collect with our gizmos, and our scientists are very excitedly talking about at the fall meeting, to practical applications. Um, it has also other implications for the evolution of the volcano as well. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens is a different animal. Um, it doesn't have alteration on it, but it does have weak parts of the volcano, which we recently discovered in a survey over Mount St. Helens. And um, <clears throat> so Mount St. Helens in 1980, uh, had abundant ice and groundwater, we have figured out since. And the eruption of Mount St. Helens didn't occur in the way that a lot of people think it occurred. What happened was magma came up into the volcano, pushed the north side of the volcano out, pushed it out, pushed it out, increased the pressures inside, and it became very unstable, and there was a landslide that occurred, and that was like taking the lid off a pressure cooker. And so it wasn't the eruption that caused the landslide. The landslide unleashed the eruption and caused the earthquake. So that blast was powered by groundwater and uh, gases built up in the volcano. Um, and it had lots of damage. The groundwater and melting snow created these giant mud flows that you, know, you can see before and after. So we flew one of these surveys at Mount St. Helens to look for, for groundwater um, that might and its potential to influence hazards. And we found it. Uh, this is a resistivity, electrical resistivity image, cross-section. So you're looking into the side of the volcano. See the south side, this brown color is very resistive, dry volcanic rocks. North side is, is quite different. There's groundwater here and clays, but this is all in the crater. And it turns out that Mount St. Helens erupts a lot. It creates these big domes. Um, they, they just kind of, they burble up, and then they blow themselves apart repeatedly. So when they blow themselves apart, they shatter, and they create these these weak layers, they're not necessarily clay-rich layers, but they're weak and they keep groundwater in them. And so we're just learning more about it, but I just wanted to show you um, that, that we can use this data to look for groundwater and different kinds of hazards. This is a, an example of the kind of hazard we might be looking for. Another volcano, Nevada del Huila, in Colombia in 2007 had a small eruption and it cracked the top of the volcano open like a melon Water poured out the cracks. Nobody had ever seen anything like this, creating a mud flow, killing 10 people. So, um, so the work we're doing on Mount St. Helens of trying to look at groundwater can also help inform these other studies. So as I mentioned, all our science is global. The works we do here can inform uh, volcanoes and volcanic hazard mitigation uh, all over the world, just as we learned when we saw Wheeler erupt that we have this kind of hazard. So it's a feedback loop. <clears throat> 